American church at a crossroads. If so, which path will we take? Let's talk about it with Eric Metaxas on Steve Brown, etc. He's, he's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. Hey, we're so glad you're here. You always have a place at our table. In case you were wondering, I'm Steve, the aforementioned old white guy. Matthew Porter, our executive producer, is here, and he hosted this show last week. Hey, Matthew, thanks for not burning the place uh, down. <laughs> And our producer, Jinx, is in his little glass booth. Jinx, thanks for not letting Matthew burn this place I checked down. all the fire extinguishers. <laughs> our one-man IT department, John Myers, is in the tech bunker. John says, finding eggs with your kids on Easter is fun. Finding eggs a week later, <laughs> not so much. <laughs> And uh, Dr. George Bingham is here. He's the president of Key Life. If you ask George how he likes his coffee, he'll tell you how he takes his coffee. <laughs> he'll just listen, I'm doing the best I, I know, can. I know, I know, you're doing great. <laughs> he'll say very seriously. And Kathy Wyatt is the soft <laughs> feminine side of the program. Kathy says she's recently been called to foreign missions, perhaps. Fiji or Bora Bora or Hawaii, those would be good places. You get into that. Wow, <laughs> I had no idea. We uh, have a great guest, uh, uh, and his name is Eric Metaxas. And if you don't know who that is, you've been living in another world. Eric is the best-selling author of 14 books. Every time he burps, they publish it. His work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the New Yorker. He hosts the Eric Metaxas Radio Show, a daily syndicated radio program. And Eric's latest book is a titled Letter to the American Church, and I hold it in my nicotine-stained fingers. You... You don't have enough trouble already. <laughs> <laughs> what? You just you you know they said to Barry Goldwater that they knew he had to walk through that field with a bull, but he didn't have to wave a red flag in its face every time he walked through that field. You are the ultimate red flag waver at the bulls of our culture, and I admire you for it. And I wonder how wise I am for having you on this program. <laughs> <laughs> I have enough enemies without yours to boot. Eric. It's funny, Steve, that you say it that way, because I honestly, very honestly, I, I, don't, I don't see myself that way at all. Um, I think th the book that we're going to talk about, Letter to the American Church, I went out of my way to write it in a measured way moderate way. I'm asking provocative questions, but I'm not trying to be incendiary. I'm not trying to be pugnacious. I'm trying to reason with those who might be reasoned with. The thesis of the book, of course, is that the silence of the church in Germany in the 30s, I wrote a book on Bonhoeffer about it, the silence of the church in Germany opened the door to hell on earth. And by the time many Christians figured out what was going on, it was too late to speak up. And so my book is about the silence of the church in America today to key issues. And I'm trying to reason with those who have been quiet or timid or afraid or confused and to bolster them, to give them biblical ammunition for why we need to speak up because the Lord commands us to speak up and to fear him and, and to fear what he thinks of what we say or don't say. But I say the whole thing in as, as measured a way as possible because I know there are good guys in the middle who can be reached, who haven't been reached 
yet who need to be reached, who need to repent of their silence. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not looking for trouble. Uh, and I, and you know, I mean that I'm, I'm only trying to, to wake up those in the church who, who might still be sleeping. I think what you just said is exactly true of you. I know you enough to know that's exactly what you're doing. But you can't help it. I mean, if you're dealing with truth, it is in itself offensive to a lot of people. And we're living in a culture where, as you have discovered, that can get you canceled. I mean, people aren't always happy with your truth. Well, you know, and I know, and you're, you're, you're playing games by pretending to be uh, so measured about this. If we don't speak the truth, we are either speaking lies or helping lies uh, to get traction. And the Lord will judge us for that. It's not that he might judge us for that. He will judge us for that. So the most moderate, sensible, wise thing we could ever do is, is speak the truth. The alternative is a nightmare, but the enemy would have us think, no, 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 there's a safe middle path. Don't say anything, you'll be fine. That's the voice of the devil. We need to be clear. That's not the voice of moderation. It's the voice of the devil who hates Jesus, who hates his church, um, and who is at war with all that is good and beautiful and true. And we need to remind ourselves of that. Otherwise, we will be silent. We will be tame, domesticated kitty cats instead of uh, the, the roaring lion that Aslan uh, is. That's God's call to us in every generation, but we're, we're seeing it particularly right now, and it's why I wrote the book. Frankly, and you know me, I wouldn't just say this. I've never in my life felt called to write something the way I felt called to write this book. I had this burning passion. I said, I've got to say these things. I, I felt it from God in a way I've absolutely never felt before, and I so I wrote it with great trepidation. I thought, Lord, if you've got something you want to say, that's scary to me because I better get out of the way. There, there better not be a syllable of Eric Metaxas in here. Uh, so I, I wrote it with great humility and trepidation and sobriety because this is serious. We are living at a time that is dramatically similar to the German church early in the 30s. And if people don't get those parallels, if you're so historically ignorant that as soon as you think of the Nazis, you think of, you know, the death camps. No, 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 no. There was plenty ramp up before we get to the death camps. And that's where we are right now. If the church is silent in America, as it is being now, just as the German church was silent, the results are inevitable. So we're just seeing a, a, a glimmer of the evil. We're getting a taste of the evil and the wokeness and the sickness and the crazy as God's mercy to wake us up. But if we do not wake up, if we do what the church did in Germany, which is say, not yet, not yet, not yet, at some point it is too late and we don't want to think about what lies ahead because frankly, we don't have the imagination. We don't understand the evilness of evil. And that's what happened in Germany. They didn't understand how evil things could get. They couldn't dream of it in a great nation like Germany and a great nation like the United States. Uh, many people, particularly Christians, cannot possibly imagine how dark and evil things can get. And so they think, I'll just keep being quiet. I'll keep being quiet. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. The pendulum will swing back. That is wrong. And we will pay a gigantic price if we don't get that right. I recently heard, and if I could remember who said it, I would give credit, it seemed to make sense to me at the time. It was not a religious person or somebody known to be religious. It was a talking head of some uh, particular network. And he said that if you have a problem with our culture, if you uh, want to stand in the right place, the best thing you can do is join a church let everybody know that you joined the church and stand and support that church. Now, that makes sense to me, but there's more to it than that. you got to be careful which church you're going to join. You better be careful because most of them are not worth joining, and that's a dark thing to say, but unfortunately it's a true thing to say. And when people say to me, I mean, I speak on this subject all around the country uh, constantly. Uh, the, the book has been... Uh, very, very well received. I'm shocked to say that, frankly, but it's, it's uh, 
uh, but letter to the American church is, is hitting a nerve around the country. But when people ask me, okay, so what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? My first thing that I say to them, number one, if you're going to a church that doesn't get this, give the leadership a copy of this book and tell them, if you don't get this, I'm going to leave, but I want you to get it. And I want to work with you to get this because we are in a dark hour this minute. But if you're going to a church that refuses to get this memo, you need to get out of that church. You need to stop giving money to that church and pretending that things are going to go back to 1985 or whatever fantasy your pastor and the church leadership is living in. When you're in a war, uh, in an ideological war, ultimately, of course, a spiritual war, you need to choose. And if you are in any way supporting a church that is going along to get along, uh, that is afraid to be controversial, that's like supporting a church that says, well, we don't want to take sides on the slavery issue because we've got people in our congregation that have a different view. It is no different. Hey, we're talking to Eric Metaxas, and his book is Letter to the American Church. Um, an important book and one that needs to be read and discussed, which means that you need to buy it, you need to give it to your friends, you need to get in a study group and talk about it. Uh, you may not agree with everything, but uh, if you don't see the problem, you are the problem. Hey, like Jesus, we're coming back. Taxis radio host, commentator, and his latest book is Letter to the American Church. And Eric said something that I've never heard him say before. He said this was a God thing. He said, I really felt called to do that. He wrote his other books to make the money. <laughs> <laughs> this, this one, uh, and I think he's right. Uh, it's a very important book. Eric, you and I share political viewpoints. Uh, only I sometimes wonder if you're not a communist. Uh, <laughs> I'm so far to the right. Uh, so, so, and and you need to know that I don't mind defending people. I offend them all the time. You should see some of the mail I get. And sometimes, different than you, I do it on purpose because uh, I'm angry. So I have to be careful. Uh, when I stand in the pulpit, and I don't have a church anymore. If I did, uh, I would give every member a copy of this book. But it, but um, if if when I stand in the pulpit, I have to be very careful. And I have to be careful because I'm so opinionated about every issue that I know. And we must, it seems to me, you know, there are issues that are absolutely... Um, contrary to truth. Uh, the pro-life issue is one of them. A lot of the woke stuff is it, uh, is, are those issues. There are other clear issues of sexuality that need to be spoken clearly. I don't have a bit of problem with those. But when I start talking about Biden and Trump, I can get into some really bad trouble. Would you comment on that some? Well, uh, it's complicated, but I think um, there's no substitute for discernment. The Holy Spirit of God, who is alive and who lives in uh, each of us, that is a genuine Christian, uh, wants to guide us because there is no right answer on some of these things. You need to have discernment. What do I say now? What do I say to this person now? Um, but at the same time, I think if there's any heresy uh, in the American church today, and of course there's there's a lot of heresy, but part of it has to do with we are overly worried about offending someone or not appearing loving. We need to worry about being loving, 
Uh, we need not to want to offend people. But in a way, we've all been captured by the spirit that I need to worry about that more than anything. Don't say anything if somebody might be upset. Someone may be being upset by your speaking truth may be the greatest mercy God ever delivers to that person to wake them up from their dream, from their nightmare, to tell them uh, his truth, which in time they will discover uh, is true. And so I think part of the problem is that we have this default mode in the American church where we say, well, but, 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 there's always the but. And I think to myself, we, we focus so much on the but part that, that, that we have really forgotten that we have an obligation before God to speak truth about the unborn. Um, Wilberforce did it with slavery. Can yeah. you imagine the forces of hell that were unleashed on him that said, how dare you import your religion into politics? Uh, how can you mix the two? Are you out of your mind? Slavery has been around since the beginning of time. What a hypocrite you are. You're a power monger. You're just a culture warrior. Wilberforce stood up and humbly said, I'm sorry, God has called me to preach the truth, to speak the truth, to bring the truth into politics and to use politics to abolish this satanic abomination called the slave trade. He got unbelievable pushback, just as Bonhoeffer got unbelievable pushback when he said, we have to speak against the Nazis. There are always two sides to every story. And right now in America, we're just hearing this one side like, oh, well, but what about the other person? You need to care about someone with whom you disagree. You need to love them. You need to know that you are as sinful as they are. But then you also need not to go along with the lies. Slavery is a wicked abomination. Uh, killing the unborn is not something that God can bless. Uh, being afraid to speak truth from the pulpit. When you see madness, cultural Marxism, atheistic cultural Marxism and critical race theory being pushed in schools, transgender madness being pushed, if you stay silent, God will judge you, just as he will judge you if you speak out of nasty anger and hatred for other people. God will judge you if you're silent. So we in the church have to become more comfortable with saying things that maybe are going to wrinkle somebody's brow or, or whatever. We're, our goal is not to wrinkle people's brows, but if we are silent in the face of evil, God will not hold us guiltless. There's no safe third religious path. And where we are now in America, you know, to, to say like, well, I don't want to be political. Tip O'Neill is not the head of the Democratic Party. We are living in a season when even though I'm not somebody that would say, well, the, the answer to everything is the Republican Party. Absolutely not. There are as many craven, uh, useless figures uh, in that party. But we have to be honest about what where we are now. We are dealing with globalism. We are dealing with cultural Marxism. We're dealing with uh, Chinese communist authoritarian tendencies among global elites at Davos and the World Economic Forum. That's the issue. And Bonhoeffer dealt with the same thing. He was trying to bring up, we need to deal with this. And people said, well, well, well wait, wait a minute. Um, you're sounding harsh. What about the other side? Well, Bonhoeffer ended up being right. The people that he was saying the church needs to push against murdered innumerable millions of men, women, and children. So it's not kind of like, well, we've all got our sins and who's to say. There is a time when we have to have discernment and we have to say, God is speaking this now. Um, and so we never need to neglect, we never have the opportunity to neglect the love part, but sometimes silence uh, is a lack of love. It is based on fear. The Lord sees it's not based on kindness, it's based on fear of what people will say about you. Um, and so I think we really have to have discernment. And we also have to think about the victims of all of these crazy ideologies that are being pushed. If we in the church don't speak against them, the Lord holds us accountable for the victims of those ideologies, the children who are being mutilated, uh, the unborn children being uh, murdered, people dying from fentanyl because we have no border. The Lord looks to his church 
to address these things. And he will hold us accountable because we claim to believe what he says. We claim to believe he defeated death on the cross and that we can speak fearlessly and powerfully for his glory. So we're in a unique position as Christians. Uh, we, we don't uh, have the opportunity, we don't have the ability to be silent. God does not allow us to be silent in the face of evil and we are dealing with evil. We're talking to Eric Metaxas. Uh, and if that doesn't make sense to you, you haven't listened or read your Bible recently. Uh, I. We're going to have some more questions about this on the other side of the break. And uh, if you miss the rest of this program, your friends will say, and you missed it? Are you crazy? So don't go anywhere. radio host, commentator, Eric Metaxas. Uh, you can find more from Eric at Eric Metaxas. That, is, that last name is spelled M-E-T-A-X-A-S. EricMetaxas.com. You can follow him on Twitter if he hasn't been kicked off recently, <laughs> at Eric Metaxas. Eric, um... I wanted to uh, thanks for talking just a little bit about uh, about Bonhoeffer. I always lo love it when you talk about that and and his refusal to stay silent. Um, is the um, do you think that the church today um, has retreated from being involved in politics, or are is the church involved but in, in the wrong way? And the reason I ask you that is you also mentioned earlier about like in the in the in the eighties. And I think there was this misconception on the part of the church back in those days, because I remember, you know, there was the moral majority and, you know, and Reagan was the president and on and on all these, you know, great organizations. I mean, the, you know, Congress was overloaded with conservatives, et cetera. And I think Christians felt like back in those days, like we really were in control. And I think there's a lot of people in my generation who long for going back to that stage because they are operating under a false assumption of what really was, who's really in control at that point. And I think they're looking for something that's very non-realistic. Am I like really off base? Yes, you are. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Just kidding. Just teasing. Um, it's complicated. I believe that the Republican Party, in, in exactly the way the Democratic Party has 100% taken for granted Black America. They said, they're going to vote for us. We can do whatever we like. We don't need to actually improve their lot. We got that group. That's exactly what Republicans did with evangelicals. It's like, mm -hmm. we don't need to actually do anything uh, to, uh, to address their concerns, to make life better. And by the way, when any constituency is clamoring uh, for certain values or certain things they believe in. The idea in America is that that's going to help everybody, right? In other words, if the poor, urban poor in America are helped, that's a blessing for the whole nation. Uh, it's not about, well, we just care about the poor. Keep caring about the poor is a sign of health in a nation. Uh, and I'm not talking about big socialist programs. But similarly, when Christians say we have our values, our values are either God's values or there are no values. What we're trying to do uh, is not win power for ourselves. I mean, it might look that way politically, but the whole point is we're trying to bless America, which means everybody's gonna get blessed. I mean, if you have actual Christians um, who understand the faith, you're gonna have more religious liberty for everybody, not just for Christians, for everybody. You can't be persecuted for being an atheist 
or a Muslim or a Jew or a different kind of Christian, because those are Christian values. And I, and I think somehow, um, you know, if we get overly political in the wrong sense, we, we make it about power and, and, and so on and so forth. It's not, it's about what God says. And I, I wanna be really clear what you said earlier about, um, you know, there are voices today when you say, what's the state of the church? I, I, I write about it a little bit in Letter to the American Church, which I wanna say is my shortest book ever in case people are afraid that it's a long book. It's the shortest book I ever wrote. But I wanna be clear that there are many voices out there disingenuously saying, oh, Christians shouldn't be involved in politics. First of all, that's nonsense. If you believe in truth, you are going to be involved one way or another in politics. Otherwise, Wilberforce would have not helped abolish the slave trade, or we would have not uh, uh, overturned Roe v. Wade. Some things are inevitably political. It doesn't mean you make an idol of politics. You don't make an idol of anything, God forbid, but you have to be involved. But there are voices in the church today saying, oh, you shouldn't be political, you shouldn't be political. They are themselves being very political on issues that they deem worthy of activism, and they are opening the door to, since we don't have a lot of time, I'll just say hell on earth, Marxist, atheistic, authoritarian control that is going to destroy the lives of millions and ultimately billions, but they're pretending not to be political, and when people with more traditional or conservative values or let's call them pro-American values, pro-George Washington and Abraham Lincoln type values, pro-founders values, when those people act politically, they're accused of merely caring about power. That is a lie from the pit of hell. It's despicable because first of all, it's simply not true. But the people making those claims are themselves working politically and they are undermining uh, the very things that keep us free as a people, that bless the poor. So um, we, we have people uh, on the left, theologically and politically, but they're playing games. They're pretending you can avoid politics they themselves are being dramatically involved uh, politically, and they are accusing those who are pro-America or whatever you want to call it, pro-freedom, of being way too political or of making an idol of politics. That is called sophistry. They're playing games. We should not listen to those voices. Name of the book is Letter to the American Church. It's a powerful book and an important book, and you need to read it. You need to give it to your friends. Uh, you need to take what is taught in this book and apply it to you, your church, and your family. Guys, this is really hard work. And we're going to take a nap, have some cookies and milk, and then we're going to return. You don't want to miss a bit of this, so don't go anywhere. bet you haven't slept during this program. <laughs> you know, some of our programs you can take a nap during and some you can't. And this is one of those because we're talking to Eric Metaxas and his latest book, which I hold in my nicotine stained fingers, is Letter to the American Church. And it is an important book. Eric, we're talking about the Christian church stepping forward and allowing God's truth to color our politics and our activism. And when you head in this direction, there's flags that go up for some people. And it's a phrase, and let me say the phrase before you jump in, because you want to, Christian nationalism. And uh, I have only found the people talking about Christian nationalism are people talking about Christian nationalism. There's nobody there that's like, we should make this a theocracy. But the 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 reaction around it, you would think there was somebody saying that. How do you respond to that reflexive uh, mindset that that arises? You just said it. 
You just said it. It's total nonsense. I never respond to it. It's a joke. It's a boogeyman. It's like people use a term. It's like saying you're a racist, you're a transphobe. They, they just come up with a term designed to shut you up. And I think to myself, if you have eyes to see, you ought to know that the last thing that we need to worry about today is Christians taking over the country. What a joke. <laughs> we have atheist, Marxist, Soros-funded globalists trying to take over the country and the world. If you are paying any attention, you recognize this. And so whenever anybody says something like, well, what about Christian nationalism? I, I'm like, what about it? Like, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll leave the room because it's absolute nonsense. And it's usually, you know, kind of lefty theological people. They think this is a thing. I got to bring this up. And I think, I don't know where you're getting it from. Please help me understand why you're talking about something that is as much a non-issue as anything could ever be. It's just preposterous. I mean, it would be like living under Nazi Germany and, and saying, but you got to worry about the Bolsheviks. You got to wor worry about those communists, those Jewish communists. You got to worry about them. Let's be honest. And you'd say, um, no, wrong. You are wrong. We don't need to worry about them. We need to worry about the national socialists who are well on their way of taking over the nation and who will butcher every person they can accuse of Bolshevism, uh, communism, uh, Jewish being Jewish. I mean, do you do you see what is happening around you? But there are always going to be those voices. Uh, and they are usually unwittingly the voices of the devil. They're simply trying to shut up people trying to bring reason and truth into the situation. So when people talk about Christian nationalism, I have to laugh because it's it's so silly. Um, it's kind of like talking about we need to worry about violence against trans people. Like, <laughs> so that that is is that really an issue or is that a made up issue? designed to shut me up on that issue. You're, you're basically threatening me that if I don't toe the line and say what you want me to say, you will cancel me, you will silence me. And I think, well, listen, we are called to be wise as serpents, not wise as doves. I think a lot of people got the memo wrong. They think we're supposed <laughs> to be wise as doves, really sweet. We're supposed to be wise as serpents. We're supposed to see when we're being lied to. We're not we're supposed to respond to a fool according to his folly. And, and Jesus said, we're not supposed to cast pearls before swine. We have to be very careful about dialoguing with people that are absolutely 100% not interested in having real dialogue. They are not interested. They're interested in wasting your time and wasting God's time in baiting you into a silly conversation about non-issues while everything is burning around us. There are terrible things happening in this country. We need to address the real things that are happening. Uh, women and children are being sex trafficked across our border. If you care about them as Jesus commands you to, you'll address that issue. If you don't care, you won't. You'll, you'll, you'll just pick whatever issue, whatever boogeyman you can pick, Christian nationalism, that's a big one. This happens over and over and over. And, and Christians, because we, you know, we have this idea that God commands us to be nice, um, we, don't, we don't deal with this. Um, and when people bring things like that up, I'm, I'm just, I'm so fascinated that there are people out there who think that's a thing. I mean, we, 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 we had mobs burning down our cities uh, a couple of summers ago. We, we had, and, and everybody acts like, no, 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 but it was, it was really that other thing. It was the, 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 the I think most Americans kind of see what's going on. And it's, it's only people that are, you know, professional, like theological bloggers who have the time uh, to pr pretend that our biggest worry is Christian nationalism. It, it is not. Mm. Uh, Eric, I, there was another term um, that was uh, used a lot uh, several years ago, especially um, the seeker friendly church. And I, I wonder if, you know, and not, you're not suggesting that a church be primarily political uh, by any means. But I don't, uh, of course not. No, certainly but, not. But you, you have uh, to open those, your doors, you have to open your arms wide 
to everyone. But at some point, you have to disciple your flock. The church is not meant to be a lot of theologically shallow people that say, like, yeah, I'm in, I'm in for Jesus. Like, yeah. there's more to it than that. That's called the starting line of faith. Now you have to be discipled. What does that mean? What is God calling me to do uh, in my life? And if you're just interested in numbers, uh, then you don't go there. You don't go to the discipleship issues. And we have a lot of tremendously uh, blessed, spoiled Christians in America that they, they, they don't feel like God calls them to war against evil on our knees, uh, in other ways, sometimes politically. We're called to live our lives for God's purposes uh, in this generation. And the fact is that uh, there are many pastors and churches that they're completely avoiding that. They act like your faith is just this little private thing. It's not a private thing. If it's just a private thing, it is not real faith. Well, and and even, and we only have a few seconds, but um, even for those churches that are not trying to offend anybody, with the recent survey, you saw, you know, dramatic drop in people's uh, attitude about, uh, you know, how important faith was, for example, and family and so forth. So for those seeker-friendly churches, it's not working if you're trying to put butts in the seat. That's so the you point. Might- yeah. yeah, that that's the whole point. It's like the model's not even working. It's like, did you, did you get the memo? Unless you're speaking truth, unless you're speaking, taking your your biblical ideas into every subject that people are dealing with in their lives, they don't have time to waste playing happy, clappy, religious hour on Sunday morning. They've got better things to do. If you're speaking truth, you you can't you know build parking lots fast enough because people are are are, are hungry for that. And I mean, honestly. I, I, I put everything I possibly could in this book, Letter to the American Church, to make the biblical case. It's not a political case, it's a biblical case. And the parallels to Nazi Germany are so frightening. I said, I have to write this book. We are in grave danger unless we get this right. Eric, as always, thank you for taking time from your busy schedule to be with us. You done good. Not on this program. That goes, <laughs> that goes without saying, but in writing this book, Letter to the American Church. Hey, guys, we'll be back in a minute and tell you who we're going to do it unto next week. been through a very awakening hour we were sitting around uh, when you weren't here and you were listening to commercials talking and we just said you know it's hard to disagree uh, with what eric says i mean he is clear he is biblical uh and he speaks it in every place he goes in a consistent way Now, you can disagree about issues, which issues are the ones you speak. uh, But there are some issues that are so clear biblically that we dare not speak. And there are, and every time he says it, I recognize the truth of it. There are parallels between what's going on in this country and what went on under the Third Reich. And what happened with the church there? And Eric is right, and he probably knows as much about that subject as anybody I know. If you haven't read his Bonhoeffer book, you ought to read it. It'll blow you away. And we can sit around and discuss, and we should, where do we stand and how do we stand? What do we say and how do we say it? And I have one personal addendum that goes with it. And that is that we stand as people who identify with the sin of others. When we say we are pure and we represent a pure organization, and if you don't get pure, you're going to hell and so is the country, I wouldn't listen to that. But if I say, look, uh, I'm as sinful as you are and I've been as wrong as you are, 
But we got to talk about these issues and ask, what does God say about them? Let's have a Bible study and talk. At that point, you begin to make an impact. But the issues are clear, or at least a lot of them are very clear. And uh, this, as I said, is an important book. you got to get it, Letter to the American Church, and maybe get with a study group and talk about it. We don't talk about these things very much in the church anymore, and maybe, maybe that's kind of sad. Okay. I hope you have somebody who's really nice and says nice things uh, next week, and we can take a nap. Well, Oz Guinness is going to be back oh. with us. Oh. And, you know, the only person who's more prolific than Eric Metaxas is Oz Guinness. But anyway, Oz has a new book out called Signals of Transcendence, Listening to the Promptings of Life. One of our favorite people. You don't want to miss how he talks funny, <laughs> but he says really good things. Guys, same time, a date, same time, same place next week. Between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't. And that gives you a wide, wide berth. Well, he used to say, I'm Steve Brown and this is my world. <laughs>